what he was back then, but I ain't, we ain't guessing ages and stuff. So anyway, um, but it was a long time ago, amen, and uh, it's good to see her faithful to God and amen. serving the Lord and all these amen. years and everything, and uh, you got a jewel, Tim, you got a jewel, and uh, anyway, I'm going to, I want to try to give you something to, uh, to challenge you a little bit tonight as a church about uh, how just how God views the church and how he views each and every one of us and try to get you to see that God's got a bigger plan for each and every one of our lives than what you may think it is. I'll promise you, whatever you think God wants you to do, it's bigger than that. His, what he really wants you to do is bigger than what you think it is. Amen. And uh, each and every day of your life. Right. And so I want to I wanna give you something to challenge you. Grab your Bible and turn to the book of Jude. The book of Jude. Chapter 23, I got one person looked up at me, nobody else looked up at me. Oh, the little book of Jude, and uh, I will say, please pray for me as I head out tonight. I got a, as soon as service is over, I'm going to, I'm not trying to be uh, unkind, but I'm going to jump on the road. I got to drive home, do therapy in the morning, drive back again, so uh, y'all pray for us as we travel. I'll bring my wife back tomorrow, amen, amen. and uh, you, uh, if you haven't met her, uh, you'll have an opportunity to meet her. So, um, Jude 22, Jude 22, one verse. And of some have compassion, making a difference. Mm. Now, you've heard this preached on many times, of course. So I want you to think about what it says. And of some have compassion, making a difference. I want to make a few statements to you tonight. First one is simply this. Our existence is for the purpose of making a difference. The reason that we exist in this life is to make a difference. To make a difference in someone else's life. Do you believe that statement tonight? How many of you believe that God desires to use you in your life to make a difference? Amen. Look back to John chapter 15 if you would. We're going to look at a few different passages here. John chapter 15. And um, notice what it says here, and Jesus speaking to his disciples here, beginning in verse number 9. <clears throat> As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Notice verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask, my fa- uh, ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Now, this passage of Scripture here, uh, he's telling his disciples, listen, I have chosen you. You didn't choose me, I chose you. And can I tell you, there, there's an application for us too. All of us that are born again, children of God, uh, God chose us, amen? And you say, well, what do you mean he chose us? He chose us when he died on the cross, the day he died on the cross. And uh, chose us to trust in him as our Savior. Hey, chose us that if we would trust him as our Savior, he'd fill us with a part with the Holy Spirit of God that would live within us and give us an opportunity to be used and accomplish what he wants us to accomplish while we're in this life. You may sit here tonight and you may say, well, I don't know how God could ever use me to make a difference. I just, I just don't see how uh, that's going to happen or take place. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I love these verses, and verse number 27 and verse number 28, uh, I want you to listen to what it says here. It says, uh, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And base things of the world and things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. What are you saying? Hey, the Lord says here, you say, well, I don't know how he could ever make a difference. Well, you're just the one that God's looking for. He, he wants to take your life and make a difference for his kingdom's sake and, uh, and to accomplish what he's given you life to accomplish. He doesn't choose the wise in this world. You say, I don't have a lot of wisdom. 
That's all right. Uh, he doesn't choose the strongest in this world. I'm not very strong. That's okay. He doesn't use the multi-talented and multi-talented uh, 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 people to accomplish his purposes. He's just looking for people that will be humble enough to be available Amen. so that he can right. use our life and accomplish what he longs to. Second Corinthians, or Second Chronicles 6, 9 is still in the Bible. The eyes of the Lord look, uh, run to and fro uh, throughout the whole earth to uh, show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. God wants to show himself strong on your behalf. He wants to use your life. Can I ask you the question? Did you pray today that God would use you to make a difference? No. That ought to be a part of our daily prayer life. God, please use me to make a difference. Good. I don't want my life to be in vain. I don't want to waste my life. I, I, want it, I want to use it for your glory. Use me, God, to make a difference. I, I understand, people, it's not about us. And none of it is about us. It's all about Him. And all about yielding ourselves so that He can work through us. We ought to wake up every day, again, asking God to use us to make a difference. We ought to be looking to make a difference from the time we wake up to the time we close our eyes at night. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, and, and when he had called unto him the 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of diseases. He called them, he gave them power to accomplish his purpose. When God saved us, he gave us power to accomplish our purpose for him, if we'll allow him to. 2 Timothy 1, 9, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began. Amen. Amen. God wants us to be used. He wants us to live this life to serve him. 1 John 3, 8, it says that Jesus' purpose was to, to destroy the works of the devil. Of course, Luke 19 and, and verse 10, it says that he came to seek and to save that which is lost. That purpose was... Uh, 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 not for our own joy and pleasure to save us, but for His joy and pleasure. Right. I quoted this the other day, Revelation 4 and verse 11. What does it say there? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Amen. He saved us to bring pleasure to Him. Amen. He wants to use our lives to accomplish that. True happiness comes not from fulfilling our own desire, but His. That's where we find happiness, fulfilling his desire, not ours. Apostle Paul, look over in Acts chapter 26. Just a lot of a little kind of groundwork to lead into. I'm going to give you a story this evening, tell you a story and draw some application from it. Acts chapter 26 and verse number 12. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about uh, me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard uh, for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Notice what he said, But rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. But what did he say? He said, I've got a purpose for you. I've, I, I saved you for a reason, for a purpose. God saved every one of us for a reason, for a purpose. And boy, we need to be looking for that every day of our life. You say, well, I don't know what God wants me to do down the... Don't worry about that. Worry about it right now. Worry about what you can do right now, how God wants to use your life even today. Um, Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. We ought to be looking for those opportunities to be used every day. How many of you believe that God is still working in the affairs of men today? Amen. Of course we believe that. Amen. How many of you believe God wants to use you to work in the affairs of men today? Not as many people <laughs> say, yeah. You know, when that the messianic prophecy of, uh, of Christ in Isaiah chapter 61 and verses 1 through 3, can I tell you that Jesus is still looking to bind up the brokenhearted? Yeah. He's still looking to bring liberty to those that are held captive. I mean, he's still looking to open the prison doors to those that are bound. He's still looking to bring comfort to those that mourn. Right. He's still looking to give beauty for ashes. Right. He's still looking to give the oil of joy for mourning. He's still looking to give the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. But since he's not here physically, 
He's chosen us as vehicles of transport Amen. to try to accomplish those things. Right. We can't do it. All we can do is point them to the one who did, the one who can. Amen. But God's looking to use us. I'm afraid that uh, uh, they're around us everywhere, and yet we're missing our opportunities every day just to be used in some simple way. If we look back at our verse, it says, and of some have compassion making a difference. I mentioned this the other night, but God is a God full of compassion. And when he saved us, he put a part of himself in us. So there ought to be compassion flowing out of us. And that compassion ought to be stirring us each and every day to be used and to accomplish the reason why he put us here. I want to share a story with you this evening. And... Uh, just an amazing story, an amazing testimony about a situation that happened just a few years back and uh, that I had the privilege to be a part of. I had come home from a vacation. Well, we'd gone to see family over the holidays. And I got home on, it was like January 3rd. And um, when, I, when I got home, I got a phone call from the, uh, uh, the local uh, funeral home. And they had called me in times past and asked me if I would be willing to come preach a funeral for somebody. Maybe it was somebody, that, an older person that had no family or whatever, and, uh, or maybe uh, somebody that had no church, and they would ask if I'd preach it. And so they asked, uh, they called, and they said, uh, uh, we were given your name by, and they named a guy that was a member of our church there in Gaylord, Michigan. And uh, he, he would go out, and he'd pick bodies and uh, uh, dead bodies up and bring them back to the funeral home and, uh, and he heard them telling that they needed somebody to, uh, to uh, preach this funeral and he said why don't you call and he gave my name so they called me and he said would you be willing to come preach a funeral and I said sure you know I, I didn't know what it was at first and he said well let me, let me explain it to you first before you say yes and I said okay he said you've heard about the young lady that passed away in town and I said no well, Gaylord's a small community. Most everybody knows anything that happens like this. And uh, he said uh, the 18-year-old girl died of a heroin overdose on January 1st on New Year's Day. And I said, I've been out of town. I just got in town. They said, well, they said it's a pretty tough situation. The, um, her boyfriend uh, had ended up uh, convincing her to try heroin, and she injected herself and... Um, her heart went into convulsions and she died. Um, he said, the problem is the, the, uh, the boyfriend is still, uh, you know, he's st he wants to be here for the funeral tonight and the parents don't want him here and there could be charges filed on him and there's just a lot of things going on here and uh, wanted to make sure you understood it all before you said yeah. And I said, well, I'd, I'd be glad to if I can be a help somehow. And uh, it was on a Wednesday. And um, they, uh, and he said, well, he said, the funeral is tonight at 7 p.m. This was like at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. And I said, oh, wow, okay. Uh, I said, uh, can I speak to the family? I, I need to talk to the family. And he said, well, you're not going to be able to do that till the viewing tonight right before the service. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, wow, how in the world is that going to happen, you know? So uh, I called Brother Jenkins right away, and I asked him, uh, I, uh, you know, I said, you think I ought to go ahead and do this? And he said, absolutely, man, well, you know, we'll, we'll be praying for you. The funeral service was at Wednesday night, 7 o'clock church time. And he said, we'll be praying for you. We'll have the, I'll get all the guys in the church together. We'll pray and to ask the Lord to bless it. And, and so I prepared the message. This young lady that died, her name was Aubrey. And uh, so I, I prepared the message basically uh, to preach in the respect of what Aubrey would say to you if she could talk to you right now. And this is what she'd tell you. There's a heaven, there's a hell, there's... A, but I wanted to fill in the blanks, you know, of the story uh, with meeting her parents. So he told me that I could meet him there at the viewing. So I got there for the viewing that day and um, uh, I went into the office and the uh, funeral director uh, said, I'll go uh, get her parents. And they went and got the parents, brought the parents in. Boy, I'll never forget the look on their face when they walked in that office. I mean, you got to think about this. This girl was 18 years of age. It was their oldest daughter. I mean, they're, they're about probably 39, 40 years of age. And uh, mom comes in. She's just sobbing. You can only imagine. And, uh, and by the way, this girl had a baby by that boyfriend, too. It's a crazy story because she was still in school. She was still going to school. She, was still, she met this guy at work, and that, that's a whole other story. But she was still going forward with trying to do what she was supposed to do in life. It wasn't that she was necessarily a bad girl. Um, so anyways, um, 
she, uh, she was just crying and sobbing. And I said, my, my name is uh, Dan Martin, and I'm here to try to uh, be a help to you. I said, listen, I'm here to help preach a funeral for you, but I want to do more than that. I want to help you. I don't want this just to be an end right here. And, uh, and she just was crying, and she shook her head and sat down. And then her husband came up, and her husband's name happened to be Bill. And uh, so he, uh, uh, he uh, came come up to me, and I said, my name's Dan. And he shook my hand, and he said, I'm Bill. And I said, uh, would you be, just sit down for a minute so I could talk with you? And he said, yeah. And he sat down. And I mean, he just, he had a stare. He stared right through me as if he wasn't seeing me, but he was seeing the wall on the other side. And uh, so I, uh, I said to them both, I said, now, listen, I, you, you all don't have a church home here. And they said, no, we don't, we don't have a church. You haven't gone to church. You haven't been. Is there any kind of church background in your life? And uh, the mother said, I went to a little Baptist church when I was a little girl, but only till I was just not even a teenager, and, and I haven't been since then. And, uh, and then I turned to the dad, and I said, how about you, Bill? And he goes, I was a Catholic, and I went to church because my parents made me go. I'm going to tell you what, I got a whole lot of questions about God right now. And I looked at him, and I said this to him. I said, you got to believe me on something. I said, I'm here to try to help you guys, and I want to help you, and I want it to go way beyond this, but but you got to believe me and you got to trust me on this. There is a God in heaven. Amen. And I said, you can't see through this right now. You can't see through because of the circumstances. But you got to trust me and believe me that God somehow wants to bring good out of the tragedy that's happened here. And uh, mom just kept crying and dad said, well... We just need to get back out. And I said, okay. So they went on back out there. I got up and I preached the funeral that night. And uh, man, they had the pulpit here and the casket was right here, an open casket, that young lady right there. And uh, tough funeral to preach. The uh, boyfriend did show up and uh, they had to escort him out. They had to make him leave. And uh, in, in the very beginning of the service and everything, um, he did end up getting charged the next day. Uh, but anyway... Uh, preached the funeral, gave that message that I told you I was going to preach, and uh, and I gave a, 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 an offer for people to trust Christ if they wanted to uh, uh, um, go to be with uh, where Aubrey is when they leave this life. They had have to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and and so I gave them the opportunity. And I mean, there's probably 17, 18 hands went up, and I mean, it was packed. It was just packed. But I didn't feel like I did much to help the family because the family was just like zombies. And at the end, all the people came up, the, the uh, Bill and, and, and the mom's name is Amber, and, and they came up and stood beside me, and people came and by the casket and everything, and they all the crying and the weeping and everything going on. And um, at the, at, when everybody had left, I turned to Bill and, and, and Amber, and, and I said, I'm just, I'm so sorry for you. But I said, uh, I told you I want to be a help to you, and I do. I've, I've got some books that I'd like to bring to you that I think would really encourage you and help you if you'd allow me to. And Bill said, well, okay, I, I guess that'll be all right. And he just, again, just like a zombie. So I'm thinking, well, I'll, I'll try to call him tomorrow and try to, so I told him goodbye and um, left. And when I, when I left, I, I looked down at my phone because I had it on silent and uh, there was like six calls from Brother Jenkins. I'm thinking, what in the world? Why is he calling me six times, you know? So I call him back and, and he said, hey, Brother Dan, how did it go? And I said, well, I don't feel like I did very much to help the family. I don't feel like I did much to, uh, uh, to, to he said, well, man, we prayed for you before the service. And he said, uh, we had probably uh, 70, 80 men at the altar praying and, and, and asking the Lord. To, I, I said, well, there was, you know, 17, 18 raised their hand to be saved, but just don't feel like I did much to help the family. And he said, well, did you hear what happened? This is where the story turns beautiful. I said, uh, hear what happened, what? And he began to share some testimony of some things that had happened. Well, this mother, the mother of the girl, had a, a brother and a sister who, or brother and sister-in-law, who were in a church downstate Michigan, and uh, they had uh, they went to a good Baptist church in in southern Michigan. Well, there was a lady in our church. Her and her husband used to go to that same church, so they knew each other. And so what happened was they. That family, when they knew they were coming up for the funeral, the sister and uh, brother-in-law, 
they called this family and said, listen, we're coming up for this funeral. Is there any way that we might be able to see you? Or, and uh, this lady had just lost her husband, this lady in our church, and uh, probably two months prior to. And, um, and she said, well, yeah, I'd love to see you. She said, you know, she said, why don't you just stay with me? And so uh, they said, are you sure? And they said, yes, absolutely. Come stay. I got room and I've got. So, uh, so they were staying with them. And um, it, what happened was there was a, uh, a young man that was in our church uh, who was a, a good soul winner, really good soul winner. And uh, he would witness to people. He was like Brother Boyd, man, anybody he'd come up to. It didn't matter where you were at. didn't matter. Uh, and, uh, and he uh, had a real close friendship with the, the lady that was keeping the family. And uh, be, because her husband had died, he would go and check on her every now and then, see if she needed anything. He just happened to show up to check on her when the couple was getting ready to go to the viewing. And as they walked up, uh, this lady's name was Mrs. McBride. Mrs. McBride said, David, do, did you hear about the, uh, about the young lady that passed away? And uh, he said, I heard something about it. And, and she said, well, this is, this is the aunt and uncle. And uh, they're staying with me. I've known them from downstate. And, and uh, he said, oh, okay. And they said, did, you didn't know her? We thought maybe you'd know her because you're so close to age. And he went to a public school. And he goes, I don't think so. And they said, well, come inside. We'll show you a picture of her. So they took him inside and they pulled out this uh, picture and showed the picture of Aubrey. And as soon as David saw the picture, he said, now I know why I know her. He said, well, why? He said, I just led her to the Lord a week ago at a gas station on the south side of town. Man, I'm telling you, that aunt and uncle started crying and they were like, well, what are you talking about? No, I'm telling you, I'm serious. I led her, and she had two friends with her. And they, they said, are you, are you positive? He said, I'm positive. They, they, two girlfriends with her. They, they said, we know who those two girlfriends are because she always hung around with those two girlfriends. And so uh, they left there now with some joy in their heart, thinking, well, this gal, even though she's gone, she's in heaven now. So they, they came over to the viewing over there, went straight to the two girls that they knew would have been the ones that were with her and said, hey, we got to ask you a question. Uh, 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 we were just talking to a young man. Did, did you talk to a young man a week ago or so at the marathon station on the south side of town? And they said, well, yeah, we did. They said, well, what did he talk to you about? They said, well, he, he gave us these little pieces of paper and he, and he told us that uh, we needed to trust Jesus to be able to go to heaven. And they said, well, what happened? They said, well, we all trusted Christ that day, trusted Jesus that day. Amen. So those two girls were saved too. And I'm telling preacher, I'm saying, good night. Why didn't I know about this ahead of time? Why didn't I, you know, why, why couldn't I have known this? It would have been a whole lot easier to preach this funeral, that's for sure. And uh, so, uh, it, so it, he tells me this story and I'm thinking, man, well, this is going to set it up then because now I can go talk to Bill and, and, uh, and tell him, guess what? Your daughter's in heaven. And try to, try to encourage him and get him to understand that he needs to trust Christ too. So the next day, I call to, uh, to get a hold of him. I couldn't get a hold of him. He was in court, I found out. And, uh, and, and finally, in the afternoon, I got a hold of him. And, and I said, hey, Bill. I said, this is Dan Martin. And, and he was like, uh, 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 oh, yeah, yeah. And I said, hey, I said, you know, I told you I wanted to uh, come by and bring some books to you if I could. And, and he was like, uh, yeah. And I, it was almost like he was distant, you know out there in Neverland. I'm thinking, what's going on here? And, and I said, well, well, would it be okay to do that? And he goes, uh, yeah. Uh. And then he just blurted out, I just got saved. Amen. I'm like, what? He said, I just got saved. And I said, you got saved? Oh, wait a minute, Bill. What, what are you talking about? He said, my brother-in-law. I said, your brother-in-law told you about Aubrey? He said, yeah. He said he told me about how that she had trusted Christ and how she was in heaven and how I needed to do it. And he said, I asked Jesus to save me. I'm so happy. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I said, well, can I come by and bring these books? And he said, sure, come on over. So we went over there, and we got there, and it walked in the house, and, and Amber, his wife's there, and, and, and I hugged Bill. Man, he hugged me right away. It's amazing what being saved will do for you, amen? He grabbed me and gave me a big hug and, and thanked me again, and, and uh, I turned to his wife, to Amber, and I said, now, Amber, I said, I heard what happened with Bill. I said, I got to ask you. I said, do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven? 
And she said, Brother Martin, I got saved when I was a little girl in that Baptist church. She said, I'd never lived for God, but I got saved when I was in that little Amen. Baptist church way back years ago. And they had another daughter whose name was Bailey who was sitting there. And I said, man, I said, I, did, does Bailey know about this? Does she know what? And they looked at me and they said, Brother Martin, she doesn't. Would you please talk to her? So I turned and led Bailey to the Lord that day. Within 48 hours, that whole family was, knew they were saved and heaven bound. I turned to Bill and I said, Bill, I said, do you remember what I told you when we sat in that office just last night? And he was crying and he said, yes, I do. I said, I told you, you got to trust me on this. There's a God in heaven and he wants to do something that will bring good out of this bad situation. And he said, I could never have dreamed that anything like this would happen. Now, all I want to do is I want to take that little story and I want to draw a little bit of application from that for us tonight. Because I think it's a perfect picture about what the Lord is looking to do with each and every one of us. You say, what do you mean by that, Brother Martin? Well, I want to remind you of a few things. First of all, Romans 8, 28 is in the book. What do you mean? It tells us that before we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to His purpose. Amen. God has a plan and He wants to work everything together for good. Now, let me just say this. You might be going through some things in your life right now that you can't understand why God's putting you through it or why. Let me just tell you, you better just trust God. He, he's working all things together for good. You just trust Him through the trial, through the heartache, through the sorrow that you're going through. You may not be able to see through the situation just like Bill and Amber couldn't see through the situation. But I promise you, there's a God behind the scenes working, Amen. and He wants to bring glory to Himself, and He wants to use your life too. Amen. Amen. Uh, Romans 8, 28 is still there. Think about the, just some things about this story here. This story, by the way, uh, it, it, it all began because of a, the, the good of this story all began because of a faithful soul winner. Amen. Good. Amen. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about David, the young man that led her and, the, and Aubrey and the two girls to the Lord. David, at that time was a uh, 19, 20-year-old kid. He'd graduated from high school and, uh, and had found out that he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. He battled non-Hodgkin's lymphoma for six years. He died at 25 years of age. But David was faithful to God Amen. through everything that he went through. He would, he would witness to anybody he came upon. He, as I said, he was a lot like Dr. Boyd. He was going to witness to anybody, wherever, gas station, <laughs> a store, whatever. He's going to give you a track. He was going to witness to you. You know, the hope that we have is in salvation. That's, that's, that's our hope tonight. And that's the hope that everybody else can have too if we would be the vessel that we ought to be to be able to share the gospel. So here's this young man in our church that God used in that way. Think, think about how God wants to put the church together, use the church for his glory. Um, not just David uh, uh, um, in the story, but just that guy that worked for the funeral home. I mean, he was a member of our church too. He's the one that told them to call me in the first place to be able to, uh, to preach the funeral for him. So, so God used this this layman in the church that was just a side job working for the funeral home, he used a soul winner in this situation to bring it. Hey, he used a, a lady that had just lost her husband a couple months prior to that and opened up her home and said, you know what? Why don't you just come stay with me? Why don't you just, just be with me throughout this time? I'm, I've, got, I've got room and I've got everything. It's because they were there. And David did what he did. Everything put together and came together perfectly the way that God intended for it to happen. There was 70 to 80 men at the altar praying. God was in that too. Amen. What I'm trying to say is God wants to use the church. Amen. And he wants to use each and every one of us, the individual members of the church. But we've got to be in tune to him. We've got to be looking to be used. Amen. Uh, as I said, we've we got to be looking to make a difference. Uh, there's people everywhere we go. There's people around us all uh, every day of our life that need something. Are, are we going to be the vessel that God's going to be able to use to help them? Amen. God's still calling and looking for people to make a difference in, in your workplace. Amen. He, he wants you to be a voice. He wants you to be a mouthpiece. 
Oh, I've heard it through the years. I know. Brother Listen, you've heard it too. Oh, well, you can't talk about religion at work. <laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to cuss at work either. <laughs> you're not supposed to talk about politics at work either. <laughs> you're not supposed to. You go down the whole list. But the truth of the matter is, I'm a Christian before I'm anything else. Amen. And we need to open our mouth and be a witness. God, God gave me an opportunity. I was sharing with Brother Listen today while we were going out. Listen, I, I'm not a pushy person, but I like to talk about the Lord. And I try to talk about the Lord to whoever I can talk about the Lord to. And in those 15 years that I was in the fire department, there's some rough years. Man, they're, they're a bunch of rough fellas, those, those firefighters, I'm telling you. But just trying to stay faithful and beg God every day. I mean, there's days that I spend more time praying than anything else. God, help me to get through this. Help me to get through this. Having to work and be around those guys. But God would give me opportunities to every, every Christmas. They got a... They got a Christmas card with a Bible tract in it. They, they got a witness from me wherever I could get opportunity to get a witness. The Lord allowed me to lead four of those guys to the Lord while I was in the department. I told you the story the other night. Uh, uh, 20 years later, a guy sends me a letter and I get to lead him to the Lord after that too. What are you saying? Open your mouth and be a witness for your Savior, Amen. the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. Tell people, He wants to use you. Amen. He's looking to make a difference in the work. And by the way, some of those opportunities that I had to lead them to the Lord were because they knew that I cared about them. And one guy in particular called me. I might have said this the other day. He called me and uh, he was having a, 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 a very difficult time and he was crying on the phone to me. This was a pretty tough guy. He was crying on the phone. He said, I, I need to talk. I got to talk to somebody. I got, but he just knew that maybe I could help him just because of trying to be that witness to him. His wife got to, I, I went in and to work and his wife had left him, took the kids. I spent four hours with him that day and I got him to see that the need that he had was Jesus. It wasn't getting his wife back. I said, well, wait a minute. No, the need is Jesus. <laughs> step by step, priority, amen, the need is Jesus in your life. And then if you accept Jesus, then you, he'll, he'll be with you. He'll help you. And you trust him for what he can do. He trusted Christ that day. Within two weeks, him and his wife were back together. Amen. They're still together today. And what, are, what are you saying? Man, there's people at work that they need to know people care. Yeah. People will come to them. People will meet the need that they have in their life. God wants to use you. Amen. He wants to use you to make a difference. Oh, God can't you. Whoa, wait a minute. I can't see how God's going to, God wants to use every one of us to put together and patchwork his beautiful story that he's working in each of our lives. Hey, God wants to use you at the gas station. Amen. When's the last time at the gas station you just pulled track out and handed it to a person across the other side? Hey, God wants you to use you at the restaurant. When's the last time you pulled a track out of the restaurant and tried to witness to the, well, Terry got used at the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say that. <laughs> Vinny felt sorry for him, but anyway. <laughs> no, seriously. Man, everywhere we go, God wants to use our life. Amen. Are we sensitive enough? Are we ready to make a difference wherever we're at? Man, this is part of revival. Amen. Just getting to the place you realize, man, my life is more than what I think it is right now. God wants to use me every day. Amen. He wants me to have a part in, in his master plan. He wants, by the way, he wants to use you in your home too. Boy, if we knew how much of a difference we make by our attitudes, by the way that we conduct ourselves as moms and dads and children in the home, boy, our homes could be so much more if we would try to make a difference in our homes, if we would try to be what God wants us to be, if we would try to fulfill the purpose that, that he gives us as a husband and as a wife, and God wants to use us to make a difference in just acquaintances' lives, just people that we happen to come across, just like the story that I shared with you here. Let me remind you again, God's still bringing good out of bad situations. He still he wants to use us. He wants to use us so much. Um, I'm going to give you just a couple other statements here. I got to flip back here on my page in my notes here. But you know, some of the toughest passages in the Scripture, some of the toughest commandments I believe in the Word of God, are some of the ones that we quote and we don't think of it as commandments. 
You say, what do you mean? Well, like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. You, you say, wait, you believe that's really that difficult? Absolutely. Because the second part of that first verse is the most difficult part. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Well, so oftentimes we're trying to figure everything out or we're trying to, we've got it all settled ahead of time. You know what? This is what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. Wait a minute. What about God? <laughs> Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he should direct thy paths. Amen. God wants to work those things out in our life. Hey, Isaiah 55 verse 8 9. I love those two verses there. Uh, what? That God's ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Amen. We can't, we can't figure every situation out. We can't figure it all out. All we can do is trust God and believe that His master plan is greater than what we think it is. Amen. He's looking to use your life and work through you. And, and, and if we, by the way, if we can't get victory in our own life, how are we going to help anybody else? He didn't die just to save us from hell. But He says in John 10.10 10, that you might have life and might have life more abundantly. He wants us to live that victorious, abundant life, even now. Keep your eyes on the Lord. I, I remember a situation that happened a, a number of years ago, another similar story. I'll tell you this, I'll be done. Um, there was a lady in our church that uh, had a, I guess it was a, a nephew who was, uh, lived about probably 15, 20 miles from from where the church was, and she asked me if I would be willing to go by and visit, try to visit them. She was concerned about their soul, and, uh, and I said, sure, I'd be willing to go. So I went to meet these people, and uh, it was in a trailer park, a rundown trailer park, and uh, the, the man's name was Andy. And so I, I went there and, and knocked on the door, and um, he, he let me in. He was kind of gruff at first, but and I told him the, who, who had uh, sent me over to, to just say hi to him. And, oh, come on in, come on in. So he invited me in. We sat down at the table, and we started talking a little bit. I told him where I was from and the church that I was and told him I was an evangelist and all that. And, and he just kind of stared me down a little, you know. And, and I said, uh, we talked about some different things, military. He was in the military. I was in the military. Talked about things like that. And then I said, well, Andy, I said, you know what, I'd like to ask you a question. He had his son there with him, too. And, um, and his wife was there. And I, I said, I'd like to ask you a question. I said, do you all know for sure that if you were to die today that you'd go to heaven? And um, he goes, sure I do. And I said, okay. I said, well, well, how do you know that for sure? He said, because I've been saved. And I said, well, okay. I said, how about, now how about you? And I turned, uh, I turned to his uh, wife and she said the same thing. And I said, well, what about your son? And his son was probably 20 years of age. And, and uh I said, do you know for sure? And he said, no. And I said, uh, would you let me share the truth of the, the gospel with you? And he said, uh, sure. So I sat there and I shared the gospel with him and he trusted Christ as a Savior. Um, his dad was excited that he'd gotten saved. I mean, and his mom was excited too. And, and I told him, you know, you need to follow the Lord in baptism. You need to, uh, uh, that's the next step. And I said, would you be willing to come and be baptized? And I, I mean, it, it's a rundown place and I'm thinking, who knows, you know, and he said, sure, I'll do that. When, tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow. He come to church tomorrow. So uh, they came. They came to church. He got baptized that Sunday. They, all three of them, they were in church and everything. Now, they didn't, they, they were faithful for a short time and then they kind of slipped out. But, but I continued to go back to that, uh, to that home and I tried to encourage him and everything. And, but I was on the road a lot. And then finally I got word from somebody that Andy, the dad, had uh, developed cancer. And he had a big tumor in his throat, and it was closing off his air passage and everything, and there was nothing they could do for it. They couldn't operate on it. They couldn't. And uh, so it was his death sentence. So uh, I, uh, I went to visit him, and, and right there at the beginning, I mean, he was still pretty upbeat about everything, and, and I talked with him a little bit, and, and uh, you know, I said, man, I said, uh, pretty tough what you're going to. Yeah, I'll be okay. I think, I think I'll be able to fight it off. I think I'll be able to. And... Uh, well, sure enough, about two months later, he called me and said, Brother, Brother Martin, would you come by and see me? And I said, sure. So I, I went over to see him, and, and the tumor had gotten larger, and he was closing him off and everything. And, and uh, 
he said, uh, Brother Martin, he said, uh, I know I'm not going to make it through this. He said, I, I just wanted to ask you, would you please preach my funeral? And I said, uh, Andy, I'd be honored to preach your funeral. Now, again, it was the, the guy looked like he didn't have much. He didn't know anybody. He didn't. Um, and so I said, but you know what? I got to ask you. I said, you told me you were saved, but I want you to give me your whole testimony. And so he shared his whole testimony about how he trusted Christ. And I said, now, Andy, if I'm preaching your funeral, this is the other thing that you got to agree on. And he said, what's that? I said, uh, you know you're on your way to heaven. And he goes, yes, sir. And I said, you surely want everybody else to know for sure they're going to go to heaven. And this was his, this was his favorite word to use. He said, absolutely. <laughs> and so I said, so I'm going to preach the gospel at your funeral so that they can know. He goes, absolutely. I said, okay. So, uh, oh, I, I went by to see him again uh, probably a week and a half later I was in. And I got there, and um, he was in a hospice and in a hospital bed and all that. And I went in, and I went up to him to, to shake his hand. And uh, he was on the bed there, Brother Bill, and he went like this. He went. <laughs> so I sat down beside him, and he grabbed my arm, and he said, Thank you for coming, Brother Dan. He barely get his words out and everything. And, and I said, Well, I said, it won't be too long now. And he said, No, sir. And uh, that day I left, and I knew I had some meetings coming up. As a matter of fact, I had meetings in California. And I flew out to California for these meetings, and sure enough, while I'm out in California, I get the phone call that he died. It was at the beginning of the meetings. I'm like, oh, how can I do this? I, and um, I said, I can't make it back right away. It's, it, there's no way I can make it back right away. They said, how long are you going to be there? And I said, uh, I'm going to be here for another 10, 12 days. They said, we'll hold this body and wait for you. They waited for me to get back from California to do the funeral. So I get to the funeral, and the, the, the areas up there, they're all small funeral homes. So I get to this funeral home, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe there'll be a handful of people that'll show up here. You know, I, you don't know how many people will be there at a funeral. And uh, so uh, I, I go to preach this funeral. I get the funeral home. There is cars lined up a half mile in every direction around the, come to find out, this guy at one time was the, uh, he was the, the lead of, a, uh, of Elks Lodge, and he did this, that. I mean, he had so many different connections with people and everything. He's just an old country boy, but he had all these connections. And I mean, there were some rough people showing up there. And uh, his family was there and everything, and they, the, the, the little funeral home was so small, there's no way they could get everybody. I mean, there were people everywhere. They were lined up, people everywhere. They had uh, uh, two or three rooms. They had TVs in, and people were in there. They had people outside, had a monitor outside, and people standing outside for the funeral. Man, I got up to preach the funeral that day. I, you know, I love these funerals where you go and you never know what's going to happen. Man, they said, well, we got some songs we want to sing. And I was, okay. Well, when do you want us to sing the song? I said, you start out singing the songs, and you do your... And so uh, I got up to preach, and man, uh, you could tell these people weren't too fond of preachers. And I got up to preach, and uh, I said, well, I'm here today. I said, uh, most of you don't know who I am. I said, but uh, my name is Dan Martin, and I'm an evangelist. I'm a preacher. And they just stared at me. <laughs> and I said, uh, I'm here because uh, Andy asked me to be here. And then they kind of just looked at me strange, and I said, uh, you see, I've known Andy for a little while now, and I said, he asked me if I'd preach his funeral. And I said, you know, I told him I'll preach your funeral, but I said, under one condition. And he said, uh, what's that? And I said, well, you know you're going to heaven. And he said, yep. And I said, then you surely want everybody else to know that, don't you? And he said, and everybody said, absolutely. <laughs> it broke the ice. I shared the gospel. Jeez. I bet there was 50 to 60 people got saved that day. I had family members come up to me that were saved, that were in church, that were um, that, uh, in, in other parts, other states and everything. And they came up and one of, one of his sons came up and said, you knew a part of dad that most people did not know. And um, he was crying and he thanked me for preaching. He said, thank you for preaching straight. Thank you for, there's people got saved here today that would have never got saved. Amen. Now here, the reason that I shared that story was simply this. One lady from our church that wanted to make a difference in her nephew's life. Amen. Her nephew's son got saved through that. And then I end up preaching the funeral 
then 50 to 70 people get saved. Amen. What are you saying? God wants to use our life to make a difference. Right. Each and every one of us. It may be, hey, preacher, I don't, I don't know when the last time you had people just write down names of people that they know in the community that need to be visited, need to be saved. Just something like that. Make a difference. God's looking to use your life. Hey, all you just give your name to a preacher. I'll guarantee, preacher, you probably don't want to go soul winning. And you don't want to let anybody know that Jesus saved them and died to save them. No, what are you saying? I'm, I'm saying there's so much that we can do and so much we can accomplish. Look for the opportunities that God gives you every day. These stories, uh, the reason I shared these two stories is because they have everything to do with the church. People in the church. The only reason I can share these miraculous stories is because of people in the church that sought to make a difference in somebody else's life. It takes the compassion of God working through us. And you've got to let it work through you. And you've got to keep your eyes and ears open. And you've got to pray every day. And you've got to plead with God. Use my life. God, please use me to make a difference. Good. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak tonight to your dear people. And Lord, I pray that um, from the stories and just from this short verse of Scripture, Lord, it's so powerful. And of some, have compassion, making a difference. Oh, Lord, you've allowed me to see so many people get hope 